Most people know Bill Gass as a writer of fiction and essays, but for me, first in my life, I knew him as a philosopher. My colleague who taught philosophy classes here for many years. So what kind of philosopher was Bill Gass, you might ask? That's not a question that's easy to answer, at least in terms of schools of philosophy or ideologies. But I can say that Bill received his PhD in philosophy at Cornell in the 1950s, and when he studied there, Cornell was a center of analytic philosophy. The term analytic philosophy is ambiguous, but at that place and in that time, I think it would have meant something like doing philosophy through the precise logical analysis of sentences or propositions in either ordinary language or the more formal context of science and math. And in fact, Bill told me that he always thought of himself as an analytic philosopher. I think that as a philosopher of literature and language, that was in fact what he always was. But I also think that Bill's construal of what counts as the careful analysis of language evolved over time into a broader and more distinctive view than that of the analytic philosophers of his graduate school days. You can see clues to the evolution of Bill's thought in that regard by some of his remarks on other philosophers and the way that they did philosophy, in particular the infamous Ludwig Wittgenstein, who spent a summer at Cornell when Bill was graduate student there. Never one demands words. Here's Bill's impression of him. He was old, unsteady, queerly dressed. He struck me as some kind of atheistical vegetarian nut. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill goes on, when Wittgenstein got to teaching the philosophy of science or the foundations of mathematics, he was absolutely brilliant. But I think that for Bill, philosophical brilliance encompassed more than sheer logical rigor. As he put it, Bill, while Aristotle's reasoning can be quite dazzling, he just doesn't have Plato's style or panache. <laughs> so much the worse for Aristotle, we might think, since it's partly by way of Plato's dialogue style that his great mind was revealed, one that used a literary form to get his philosophical ideas across. More directly to the point of the development of Bill's own thought, it's important to note that he came to part ways with his dissertation director at Cornell, who was Max Black. The topic of Bill's dissertation was metaphor, and as a major exponent of the analytic philosophy school in what we might call the classical sense, Black definitely did not hold metaphor in high regard, particularly when it was used in philosophy and science and math. So Black said, to draw attention to a philosopher's metaphors is to belittle him. It's kind of like praising a logician for his handwriting. And that is, metaphors are decorative at best. Bell, on the other hand, had a more expansive view of the nature and value of metaphor, both in language and in life. And in fact, he came to think that there could be non-linguistic metaphors. I quote Bill now, <clears throat> Metaphor has been thought to be the bad of language, but you can make metaphors just by juxtaposing ordinary objects. If so, then metaphor may be more philosophically important than Black believed. To say this, I want to consider two ideas that emerged during Bill's 30-year career, which suggest how his views resonated with the history of philosophy since 1955. One idea is that our thoughts and memories have a narrative form. We understand objects and events by telling stories in which they appear, and metaphor play essential roles in the narratives, especially body, bodily metaphors like she was a rock, reliable in every way. If it's true then, as Bill says, that objects can be arranged metaphorically, then surely thoughts about those objects might have metaphorical dimensions as well, as this theory maintains. More than that, maybe thinking itself is like juxtaposing objects. Scott Fitzgerald once said, I was forced to think. 
My God, it was difficult. The moving about of great secret trunks, putting some next to others where they may never have been before. The second idea is that sometimes thinking and remembering depend on visual imagery, that is, mental pictures in some sense of the word. Bill's idea that there can be metaphorical objects suggests that mental images, and not just concepts or sentences in a language of thought, can function metaphorically too, since pictures preserve the key features of what they represent. This is, of course, an ancient idea, but it gained new life in the 80s and 90s fueled by psychological research. Both of these issues were of great interest to me when I came here some 30 years ago, so I was very keen to have a chance to talk with Bill about them. One night, on my first visit to campus, in fact, Bill drove me around after dinner to see the sights of the city, and we stopped at the end of the night in front of the art museum. There was a little fog, facade of the museum and the fountains in the lake were all lighted up. It was a beautiful scene. Bill and I sat there under the words above the door of the art museum dedicated to art and we talked about the philosophy of art and literature at great length. Fresh out of graduate school at Columbia University, I remember thinking to myself then, <clears throat> well maybe St. Louis isn't so far from New York after all. <laughs> Over the years after that, I occasionally sat in on some of Bill's classes on subjects such as the sentence or the paragraph. Bill said that in his classes, he always aimed at <clears throat> the clearest possible orderly expression of ideas. And it was intriguing to me to see how he did that using images and metaphors, analytic philosophy done with Benash. When the philosophy, neuroscience, psychology program, the PNP program, which will be familiar to some of you, was developed here, <clears throat> Bill was, I think, generally supportive. Although he liked to refer to artificial intelligence as artificial insemination, and I think the meaning of the analogy is pretty clear. <laughs> but one day at a department meeting, I think an unfortunate event occurred. As part of a sweeping effort to clean up and rationalize the curriculum in philosophy to modernize the department, as one historian put it, a faculty committee had made recommendations that amazingly left Bill's class in philosophy of literature out. At the meeting when the changes were discussed, Bill made some angry and eloquent remarks about the disrespect that this implied for literature and for his broader view of analytic philosophy and he stormed out of the room, never really to return again. Philosophy's loss, the writer center's gain, but in my view itself, a metaphorical moment in the history of philosophy in which passion and poetic indignation were seen to carry the day. I'll miss the philosophical conversations I still had with Bill in the years after that, which for me were always an exercise in trying to figure out for myself how to reason with style. Thank you.